Hello, thank you all for joining. My name is Mark Converti. I'm Vice President of the Board for the Symphony of the Southwest. Uh, today, this evening, we're going to have the second in our series of Evenings with Cal. Cal Stewart Kellogg, Music Director of the Symphony of the Southwest and the Youth Symphony of the Southwest. So, um, let's visit with Cal. Good evening, everyone. I certainly hope you're all staying well and healthy through this terrible pandemic. But since we are all kind of blocked in our houses, I've been asked to share an experience or two of mine in my early career as a conductor, which might prove, I hope, of interest. Otherwise, we've wasted a whole half hour. Last month, I I told of uh, my early experiences as a bassoonist at the St. Cecilia Conservatory in Rome, Italy, and where I played my bassoon in the conductor's orchestra, the student conductor orchestra, presided over by Franco Ferrara. And during the course of my time in that orchestra, I decided that I would study with him and be one of his students. And I had to meet certain requirements in order to get into his class, so I compressed seven years of composition into three years and managed to get the requirements in time. And for some strange and inexplicable reason, which was covered in the first episode, I was granted a conducting scholarship to join a workshop that he ran every summer in Venice. I'd like to pick up the story where I left off the last time to further describe the uncanny and most of the time frightening talent that Maestro Ferrara had. A talent that unfortunately has gone amiss for no one really knows since he, has, he had an epilepsy that caused him to faint during performances and his career ended early. Although he was able to conduct movie music because the Cina Città, Cinnamon City there uh, outside of Rome, they built a special cabin for him of plexiglass and padding down below. In case he were to faint, he would not injure himself. And for all you Italian art flick buffs, and who isn't, all of the F Fellini movies were, the mu mu music was composed by Nino Rota, a great gentleman who I will speak of further on down the road, and Franco Ferrara conducted all of the scores. Franco Ferrara was a man that it list, he existed for music. His only interest was music. It's a strange thing to say, but you'd find him sitting on one of those marble benches in the conservatory foyer area near the bar with a far distant look in his face. You'd come up to him full of energy, buongiorno maestro. Your voice would draw him back from wherever he had been visiting, and he would say, buongiorno. Still peppy, you're saying, maestro, che si fa oggi? What, what are we going to do today, maestro? Nine times out of ten, he'd look back at you in a sad voice and say, non so, which means, I don't know. Realizing that this is getting, getting nowhere, you say, well, maestro, look, I've got the problem here with this. This section of the right of spring, I really don't know what to do with it. And all of a sudden, his body tenses. He turns and looks for your score, which you hand to him. He then holding the score in his left hand and looking over, the score, or looking over the problem, he seems as if he is a predator ready to jump on his prey. With his right hand then, he shows you, he demonstrates how he would solve the problem. The man never explained anything. He merely showed you what he could do. After that, he gave his score back to you and he's off into the twilight zone that he was visiting earlier. It was impossible to reach this man. He was just totally isolated. Maestro Ferrara used to yell and scream and hurl insults at everyone that studied with him. And I was no exception. We all got it. But somehow I kind of realized that part of his screaming and yelling was his own frustration at not being able to explain himself in a technical way to his students. He, as I said, merely showed you what you were doing, what he was doing, if you were clever enough to get past the insults and concentrate on what he was saying about the music and how 
he would like you to approach it. You could learn a lot. No one could really imitate him. It was, he was too perfect in his own way to be imitated. But if you could grasp a, a gesture of his and make it yours, you'd find that it really worked. And over time, your conducting skills would improve. But Maestro Ferrara had more than just conducting ability. He had a way, as I put here in my notes, to transform a piece of music into something riveting and thrilling. And I was about to experience it for the first time in Venice. Now, many of you probably have been to Venice, and you realize, I'm sure it's safe to say, that Venice is a city that time forgot. Regardless of where you've come from, the hustle and bustle of everyday life ceases to exist in Venice. There is no way to hurry anywhere. You have to walk. Well, there are at least four ways of getting to where you need to be. You can walk down the walkways and across the footbridges. You can use the, the treghetti, as they call them, the ferry boats. And then if you have more money in your pocket, the gondolas and the, taxi, the taxis that have been featured in many films. There is no way to hurry in Venice. Our rehearsals were at the uh, St. George Island across the bay, and it just took forever to get there. But in getting there was half the fun because you had the landscape, uh, the seascape of the city behind you, and the island coming in front with the seagulls and the all. It was just it was a wonderful place to be. It is uh, regrettable that my presence at the conducting workshop did nothing to lower the high esteem I had of myself at that time. But Maestro Ferrara would change all that shortly. Each of the conductors for there, uh, there for this, the workshop was assigned a piece of music at the end of the first week. And then we prepared that one piece of music with him guarding over us till the end of the time when we gave our concert. He gave me the overture that Verdi wrote to Giovanna d'Arco, his seventh opera. Jo Joan of Arc. It seems simple enough. It started with a timpani roll, and then every two bars, the orchestra got a little louder and a little louder and a little louder and a little louder, and finally, at about the 16th bar, a crashing entrance of the brass. Well, I didn't really see much in it. It was a crescendo. So I got up in front of the orchestra and started to conduct it. When we got to that first explosive climax, no! came from the back of the hall. I turned around and looked. Ferrara was in the aisle, walking towards me, and saying very quietly, qualcosa non funciona. Something is not working. He looks at me and says, something is not working. Do you know what it is? And I said, no, no, Maestro, I really don't know what it is. Do it again. As he continues to walk towards the podium, I did it again. Got to the same climactic moment. No! Now he's on stage, and he walks over, and I'd seen him do this time and again with other people. Now I was going to be the victim. I knew it. He came to the front, in front of the violins, turned to me again, and said, Qui questa non funziona? Here, something is not working. Sai cos'è che non funziona? Do you know what is not working here? His eyes are dark. His face is white. He takes the score and pounds on it. Perché qui? Proprio qui, i demoni devono uscire fuori. Here, the demons have to come out. Then he grabbed my left forearm with his right hand, and with his left hand over here he said, let's do that again. And we started together. With every two bars there was the crescendo part. When every two bars, he strengthened his grip on my forearm. And by the time we got to the crescendo that culminated in the doomsday sound that he got out of the orchestra, I thought I was going to lose <laughs> the circulation in my arm. I looked at him when we got there, and it was a demonic look that he had on his face. Demonic. And the sound that the orchestra produced there was frightening. I have never heard anything since, and nor has anybody, anyone that was playing in that orchestra. It was absolutely riveting. He stopped after that and said, see, this is what was missing. <laughs> Thank you, Maestro. I'll try to remember that. Who could, re who could reconstruct anything, anything like that? But the lesson I learned that day was simply this, that music is music. 
give it your all, understand what is being expressed, and go about it. Make it happen. Humble yourself in front of music. And uh, once or twice, I had some very important engagements thrown my way just being there as a student. I accompanied Salvatore Accardo, the famous Neapolitan violinist, in the Paganini Violin Concerto No. 1 for a special concert and other things like that. He was giving me exposure when he thought it was possible to do that sort of thing. One night, I was asked to go to the Ferrara's house for dinner. Now, all of us knew that if you were asked to go to Ferrara's house for dinner, you were going to be expected to do something for it. That's just the way he operated. And sure enough, after dinner, it was explained that he needed my services for something I'm going to explain right now, taking the long way around. Imelda Marcos, first lady of the Philippines, toured the world, collecting the finest teachers she could find and hiring them at outrageous salaries to uh, go to the Philippine Islands and instruct young Filipinos in the arts of music. Word reached her that Franco Ferrara was the greatest orchestra teacher that there was on the place, face of the earth. So for about a two and a half year period, she would periodically show up in Rome to visit Franco. At this dinner, Ferrara produced a letter from the Cultural Center of the Philippines. The artistic director was writing him to say, we would like you to come for a two-month engagement at the Cultural Center of the Philippines to instruct its orchestra there and better its quality. We will pay you $20,000 a month for two months December 74, January 75. All expenses paid, $10 a day per diem, and of course, first, traf first class travel from Rome to Manila and back. He sat silently for a minute or two and looked at me and said, well, I, I, I can't go without my wife. And my wife would have to travel first class, and she'd have to have her hotel expenses picked up, and she'd have to have a, uh, a $10 a day per diem, so as you see, they'll, they'll never accept that, but write them back and thank them for the offer. I wrote them back, and about 10 days later, a second letter arrived. Bring the wife. He says to me, well, it's all very well. I'm glad that Maritza will be able to go with me, but we can't leave our dog. Leah, our lovely dachshund, I mean, she's only two years old. We, we, we couldn't possibly leave her for two, two months alone. And, and, of course, Leah would have to travel with us first class, and she'd have to stay in the hotel, and hotels usually don't allow animals, so it's certainly not going to work. But go right around and, and th thank them for thinking of it. Ten days later, bring the dog. Now feeling that he was being backed into a corner, Ferrara turned to me after a, a moment of silence thinking of this last letter and how to re respond to it, and he said, but I don't conduct. I, I, I've never, you, you know I can't, uh, I, I can't do it. It's just not within my nature. I, I need someone on the podium as my assistant to transfer my thoughts to the orchestra. Uh, by the way, what are you doing in uh, December and January? Well, nothing, Maestro, really. Well, good, that's good to know. But let's write back and say that I can't come without an assistant who I will pay out of the stipend that I'm given, but that the assistant has to travel first class, has to have his hotel taken care of, has to have a $10 per diem. And chances are they'll forget all about this and just throw in the towel, but thank them anyway for their thoughts. Ten days later, you know what happened. Bring the assistant. So now we're looking to prepare ourselves for a 36-hour travel from Rome to Manila. But there was one catch before I get on with the story. We have to know that one night flying from Palermo to Rome in a tremendously difficult uh, atmospheric condition. The plane that he was on was tossed and turned willfully, uh, helplessly in the wind. And he prayed to St. Mary, saying, if you save me in this situation, I will never fly again. It had been 20 years since he'd been in a plane. Now he was facing 36 hours worth of travel time to get to where he was going to be paid $20,000 a month. I think the $20,000 a month bit won over the 
breaking his vow for, <laughs> to the, the Madonna because he showed up and never complained. We got on the plane. It was eight hours from Rome to Karachi, another eight hours from Karachi to Bangkok, and then there were 16 hours from Bang Bangkok to Manila. We arrived there in the morning, and we were immediately whisked to Malakanyan Palace, where we were met by an entourage of people waiting to say goodbye to Mrs. Marcos. She was leaving on a diplomatic journey, which would keep her uh, away from us for almost the two months that we were there. But she had to meet with Franco to welcome him to the Philippines, to make sure that his wife was uh, well connected to her Blue Lady group, and that we knew how to get in touch with our driver, who always carried a gun on his shoulder. We went to the first rehearsal, Maestro Ferrara and I, and we heard an orchestra tuning up that did not augur well, shall we say. It sounded like less than a high school orchestra at its worst. We walked in, and not only did we see the orchestra tuning up and getting ready to play, but there were a number of conducting people with their batons waving their hands and gesticulating in the air. Ferrara was surprised then to learn that somehow his presence had been made known all over the Asian countries and that many people came down to study conducting with him. Now he was really stuck. Not only did he have to teach the orchestra how to play well, but he had these kids to work with as well. Well, he took a deep breath and suggested he looked arbitrarily into the group of people that were hopefuls and said, you, just go up there and let's, orchestra, would you please get the, uh, the overture to Freischitz out, please? Let's do that. Well, the candidate started, and not very well. The violins were not together. The cutoff wasn't good. And there's a, a four-beat vamp. The strings go, dee do dee do dee do dee do Horns. There's a horn quartet, a very famous horn quartet, right there, right? Well, you couldn't distinguish where the rhythm was in that one four-beat bar, one four beat bar. And the horns came in, and it was a disaster. It was just all over the place. His face was getting longer and longer. He let them get through that section as best he could, and then he stood up and went over to the podium, as was his desire most of the time. He turned to the candidate, smiled at him, and said, let's, let's do that again. Ancora. Ancora, he would say. That's again, right? So they started from the top. As he started from the top, he just sort of looked at people, as they were playing, and all of a sudden, intonation came into view. We could tell what the notes were. And the bar before the horns came in was very placid and in tune. And he gave the cue to the horns, and ladies and gentlemen, it sounded like the Berlin Philharmonic. I've never heard such a transition in any way by any group so quickly as it was. And he only conducted maybe the first eight bars of that, and he stopped. And the orchestra stood up and applauded for about two minutes. I had never s sensed or felt anything like that. This man had a charisma that was startling. I saw him twice in a busy restaurant silent the room when he walked in. And people would be talking, suddenly they'd stop and they'd turn around and look because behind them something was happening they didn't know anything about, but there he was. They didn't know who he was but they knew that he was something special. We were there for two months. We also worked with the Manila Symphony, which was the old pro group. And that was my time to conduct the orchestra with Ferrara helping me through the, the repertoire that we were working on. But Ferrara had just traversed half of the globe after having not flown for 20 years and was feeling rather like he had accomplished something. And he tried successfully to conduct. He never stopped, but he would take those sessions to just try out his luck and see if he was going to fall. Of course, I was very apprehensive of the, the fainting spells that he would always have and was always standing there to try to block his fall or catch him, but that never happened. And I witnessed a performance of the Romeo and Juliet fantasy overture and the, second, the finale to the second uh, symphony of Brahms, 
that were absolutely hair-raising. There sounds, again, that these people played for him that they had never created before. And on a reading, truly, truly amazing. It turns out that just about a week before our final concert, Mrs. Marcos came back. She had, we were on this great, well, they called it a yacht. It was more like a cruiser. I don't know how many cabins were downstairs. It was just enormous. And we shoved off into the Manila Bay. We were all called on deck. Mrs. Marcos sat in the middle of the deck and nodded to a matronly woman that was back, back where the cabins were down below. Thus started a parade of young Filipino girls carrying boxes. They would arrive at Mrs. Marcos, and she would open each of the boxes and tenderly demonstrate what was inside them to Franco and the others, but especially to Franco because he liked beautiful things. The jewels that she exhibited were priceless, and there were at least 25 boxes of these things. It just was a stunning array of beauty, but of course, when there's great wealth and great poverty in the same place, you think that something really is amiss. And let's just leave it at that. The next morning, I was aroused at about 6 o'clock with somebody pounding on my, my stateroom door. I was called to the deck. There, a, uh, a regular-sized yacht was aside the... Uh, cruiser, and the uh, gentleman that had aroused me said, uh, President Marcos is going on a fishing trip and wanted to know if you wanted to come with him. Don't worry, we'll find you a, sea, uh, a suit and an aqualung. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I never had any experience with an aqualung, and I would beg everyone to understand that, and I, I'll stay here. When that was passed along to Marcos, who was already on the boat, he mentioned something under his breath to others who roared laughingly at my refusal to come along, and then they were off. I went back downstairs and waited for breakfast. And I believe we were shown at least the beginning of where the death march began. In the afternoon, I was summoned again to the president's presence, and he asked, do you play racquetball? Well, I made the mistake of saying, well, I play ping pong. He said, well, it's pretty much the same. I need you as my partner. We're going to go downstairs and play uh, in the gym. Well, I'm happy to say that he played a very good game of racquetball because he carried me the entire game. And I don't know why I would want to go on record saying that I played racquetball with the president of the Philippines, but there it is. It happened. We went back, <laughs> went back to Manila for the final concert, which was a stunning event. And there is a picture of uh, Maestro Ferrara at the end of it, actually smiling. Not a professional smile, but a really, truly wonderful accomplishment smile, which certainly made him very happy. And I'm glad that we were able to do that. Could we get a picture, uh, could we get a close-up of something here? Is it possible? Sure. This. This is Maestro Ferrara and myself and three of the conducting students, one being a nun. And if I was clever enough to get that other picture out, as I don't see, it would be worthwhile to see the smell on his face. That was to uh, my, my association after this run at, in the Philippines was at an end with Maestro Ferrara. I, in six months, I was to win my international competition at San Remo, the Gino Mariluzzi conducting competition. And a week later at La Scala, I finished second and got my career going in October of 75. He was to return to the Philippines. And once everybody, word got out that he actually flew somewhere, he started going everywhere. He was at Tanglewood for a while. He was in Denmark and other places. A great man. And I... I still miss him, even though we never really connected too much on a personal level. To watch the man conduct anything at all was gold. And now, if there's anybody that has a question or two, I'll be happy to field them. Yes, uh, we have several questions. The first one 
as uh, submitted by Kathy. She says there's a rumor floating around that um, there's a picture of you with Leonard Bernstein, the legendary uh, conductor, composer, uh, celebrity. Is that true? Yes, it is. In fact, um, I think, now I, I believe it was the Symphony of the Southwest and the Youth Symphony of the Southwest that did a joint side-by-side uh, -side concert in which we did the Bernstein sym symphonic dances. And for that particular um, concert, I produced this picture to see if anybody would recognize who was standing behind him. Are you ready? Yes. In 1963, Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic did a uh, an historic tour in South America. They came back and they uh, landed here in Miami, Florida. I happened to be president of the Youth Symphony of, the, of Miami at that time, and I was invited to this reception. And the man that was taking pictures saw me walking behind him and shooed me into view, and he took the picture. Uh, I was not too close to him, but close enough to realize that I was actually taller than he was even then. <laughs> I had yet to grow a bit. But uh, Fer uh, Bernstein would come periodically to Rome during the time that I was studying with Ferrara. And every time he did, Ferrara would suspend all classes and we would go to the radio orchestra or wherever Bernstein was to uh, watch him work. So I had more than an opportunity to be close to the man, although I never really said, hey, by the way, you know, I took a, there was a picture taken of the two of us years ago. <laughs> I never did that. Okay, the next question comes from Dan. What do you listen to on your own, for your own enjoyment or when you're relaxing? Dan, I, I would hate to say this uh, and make it public, but I don't listen to music. It's too technical a thing for me. Now, if you want to do the Beatles, if you want to do Simon and Garfunkel, the things of my youth that mean something to me because of the time that I heard those pieces, I would say that I would listen to those. But yet, I don't make a habit of listening to anything, especially symphonic music. When we wake up to K-Bach in the morning, I find myself analyzing everything that I hear. It's just, it, it's, it's just too much of a thing, so I just avoid it. Sorry if you expected something different. And finally, the other question we have here is, of all the places you've been to, uh, let's say outside the United States, what's your, what was your favorite uh, country? Scotland. Oh. Edinburgh. There's a story that I might tell one time uh, about the Edinburgh Festival and how the Washington Opera, with its twin bill of Menotti's The Telephone and the Medium, performed there. I must have roots in Edinburgh or in Scotland because I felt like I was back home. Never felt so close to home as when I was there. And the Scottish, National, uh, the Scottish Chamber Orchestra that played the, the, uh, the gig with us it was absolutely fantastic, and we got along wonderfully well. And I managed to play St. Andrew's Golf Course, which, of course, is the mecca of most all golfers. So I, I would have moved to Edinburgh had something worked out with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, but it never did. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we've reached the end of our time. So once again, Cal, thank you for spending the evening with us. and. Uh, uh, telling us about your colorful career. Thank uh, you. We, we look forward to the next time we can meet with you. Okay, so will I. Thank you. Bye-bye.